thank you all for joining us here. Uh, my name is Haki, Brother Haki Ami, here speaking here on behalf of the Teaching Artists Institute, and welcome to our second annual international uh, MLK Day event. So it's an honor and pleasure to join you here uh, this day. And so I'm very pleased to have this discussion with some of our wonderful, wonderful international <coughs> partners. Uh, and uh, without further ado, of course, I will first, I'll just say I'm from the U.S. in the Baltimore area, uh, politically active, I'm author, speaker, and, uh, you know, so been doing a lot of organizational work for quite some time and many different levels. And so the Teaching Artists Institute uh, has been working with many different countries all over Africa, 16 uh, to be exact. And so we have connections to many different people and you will meet some of them uh, this uh, day. But Kim Poole, uh, the founder, uh, founder of Teaching Artists Institute, I know she's here. She'll be, uh, if she's not totally available right now, we'll hear from her uh, really soon when she's set in place. We had a meeting earlier and so she's finishing up with that, but I am able to pass this to my sister from the Netherlands via by way of Kenya. And so she has unmuted and uh, I wanna thank her for coming back and joining us again. Uh, last year we had an amazing, amazing uh, uh, Kwanzaa well, Kwanzaa, as well as MLK Day, uh, where we had some international speakers from all over. So I'll allow her to uh, join us and share a little bit about her. I know I interviewed her uh, some weeks ago, a few weeks ago, speaking uh, where she teach language uh, with her university, her online school, and uh, she has several books as well. But I'll let her come on, Sister Odelia, and share a little bit about herself. And thank you again for partnering uh, with us. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, Haki, for that wonderful uh, introduction. I would like to welcome all those who have turned in, tuned in from Africa, Europe, and America. I saw some people from Cameroon, from Nigeria from Netherlands. I had already introduced myself. I think I'm Odilia Anyachi and uh, I am a Pan-Africanist. And it's a pleasure to, to, to be here with all of you to visit this, uh, to celebrate this Martin Luther King Day. Once again, we are gathered to celebrate Martin Luther King Day, a day dedicated to acknowledge all those in service ministry. Of course, we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors while we celebrate it. So many sacrifice their lives to make me and you live better. I would also like to acknowledge Dr. Njeri, who is among us. She serves in the African school as a knowledge sharer. She's also playing a huge role in making us understand our history and our rights as Africans. Jerry, for the service you are giving in several museums to uphold African heritage is greatly honored. Thank you. As an African, I would like to talk about Ubuntu, the famous African philosophy that our ancestors used and some of us still use for survival, especially in Africa. According to Dr. Taki Dube in her book, Bantus, she eloquently explained the meaning of Ubuntu. It, li it literally means Ubuntu. That is the process of being able to recognize Muntu in another. Being able to recognize that the other is just a spirit, Muntu, as you are. If you are able to see Muntu in someone, or see yourself as that Muntu in someone, then you have become Umuntu in Zulu, Mundu in Luya, Kenya, or Muntu 
in Swahili. I am because you are is the nearest explanation given to the adage. The essence of this translation loosely is I become human when I am understood and accepted by other humans who can hear me and validate me as equal, worthy, and meaningful. In turn, they are human when they develop the empathy to hear, understand, accept, and validate another as created in the image of God and God's true representative. As long as our focus is on ourselves in a self-seeking and self-interested manner that is blinded to ourselves and God in the other, we have not matured to Ubuntu. Studying the customs and traditions of African Abantu, including interviews with several elders, it has been realized that there are four postures that mature one into Umuntu. Mm. The first one is the upward posture, which according to Dr. Nehatalu, this is the belief that Abantu or people or humans are not self-existent. They are created by God. The second is the outward posture towards others. Outward posture towards others is the posture Abantu or people or humans draw on the universal love of the creator to strengthen them for their interaction with others so that they are able to see their faces and the face of God in the faces of others. The third, the third one is outward posture. It is the posture to connectedness to all life, human and non-human, in communion, communalism, and communal communality. And the question is, what is communalism, communion, and communal communality? Now, communalism is having things in common. It is the participation of everyone in ownership, responsibility, and profit, according to Dr. Neluvalani. Communality is the spirit of cooperation. And communion is fellowship. It is the interchange or sharing of thoughts mm -hmm. or emotions through authentic and intimate, intimate communication and sharing. This outward posture is what allowed Africans to always be willing to hear another, no matter whom they be. And there's a saying that goes like this, stone has no ears. So it's people who listen to others. Connectedness to environment. Environment includes fire, earth, water, and air. Ubuntu is to understand that one is linked to one's environment and each state is to be loved, honored, and respected. We cannot detach forgiveness from Ubuntu. The ability for me to see me in you is when I practice forgiveness. As the saying goes, when you see that a sister's crown has moved, please help her put it right instead of pulling it down. Forgive and show love because you are not perfect either. Habarigani. When Africans inquire by saying Habarigani, they are asking about your whole being and your environment. How are the children? How are the cows? How is the harvest? How is your job? They are also available to listen actively until the speaker is fully unburdened if this becomes necessary. The process of unburdening is the simplest manner of service and it is called listening. 
Even if, if you have no talent, no money, you can just offer the basic service of listening to one another. Because in him or her, I see myself. And that was my presentation about Ubuntu. It is a pity that you could not see the pictures. And now I would like to introduce to you a woman who has lived a life of service all her life. Her first service was giving water to a Mau Mau fighter whom she had founded, heavily, whom she found, who was heavily wounded and lying in a ditch. She was only around five years old. While in the government, her impact in women advancement movements across Africa was recognized by the United Nations, which triggered funding for gender ministries. As a senior in the community, she commands respect among many who still seek her advice when it comes to community and especially women organizations. At the age of 15, Terry Kantai and sister Jayan Paula founded Women Union for Social Action to address the eman emancipation of women and girls, a movement that draws membership from Catholic diocese to, to date. As an officer at the provincial level in the 70s, she helped women change the colonial names of women clubs to groups and mobilized women to start the famous Mabati women groups with three specific objectives. Number one, removing the grassroots, two, collecting rainwater, and three, acquiring a grade cow for each member. To date, the idea and projects have formed formulation of women's empowerment. Terry was instrumental in establishment of the first national machinery for the advancement of women. She headed the bureau which was recognized by the United Nations and quickly attracted donor funding for organized women groups and NGOs. Her mobilizations and organizational skills led to the growth of organized groups from 600 to 43,000 in four years. She is nationally and internationally known for her commitment in promoting women's socioeconomic power, empowerment. Through donor funding, unique projects that would greatly change the perception of women such as beekeeping, fishing, fiber boats, milk goats, bulls and plows for farming were established. She assisted the Muraru women in 1974 to save money and finally get a loan to buy the first women owned public transport bus in Taita Taveta County in Kenya. The Economic Commission for Africa and the UN agencies recognized the work of the Women's Bureau sent and sent her to various countries like Nigeria, Botswana, and Zambia, and, and many more African countries to advise the governments or the importance of establishing national machinery for women and gender ministries. Terry's policy inputs in government is known for having ensured that women contribution was acknowledged in the five-year development plan for preparing cabinet memorandum, urging the government to set up the gender ministry, preparing the first national social welfare session on paper and forming a core group that established the national Population Council among government to set up, among others, Mama Terry, welcome, and we are hungry to hear about you. Tell us everything about your work, the challenges that you faced because Mama Terry is already retired, and also the advice that you can give to the young women, especially women, to the young people and especially women any advice would be appreciated. Welcome, Terry. I'm so happy. I'm very greatly honored. And uh, I'm very happy that I'm associated with this forum and those, uh, the work you are doing. And that um, <coughs> you are really putting our history in the map. Uh, that gives us hope and faith that things will be better. I'm Terry Kantai and I am a Kenyan. I live in Nairobi. 
Uh, Odilia has talked about my work as a young person assisting the Mau Mau fighters, a movement that helped us attain independence in this country in 1963. As we were all rounded up and put into the village, and uh, it was all fenced with wires to send us the children to go to the to the to our farms to see whether we could find any food. Uh, we were past the <coughs> colonial government because we were children. And uh, the advice was that uh, you take care, you go. Do not tell anybody that you have seen them. So I learned to keep secrets from the time I was very, very young, that I had seen and I knew nothing. Well, this particular incident when I was very young and found somebody in the dish, uh, the Mau Mau would die. So they dug a hole and they put him there, I think. <laughs> He was, um, he must have been uh, hit by a bullet because his woods were smelling badly. And I was about to step on him when he said, hey, you girl, please do not step on me. I'm here and don't tell anybody and I need water. I was trembling. I ran to the river with the, with the bottle I had and brought the water checked to make sure that nobody has seen me. And then I got bananas to give him from, from the farm, the ripe bananas. I gave him four bananas and disappeared as quickly as possible. I did not discuss. But I can also say it is not just that incident. It is the whole of that period during the 50s and 50s when we were to run errors to take the food to the fighters in the bush, pretending we are fetching water, and in the, in the baskets we are also carrying food. And we would go with the broom and, 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 and sweep the, 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 the steps that we have used to get there, or the step that any of the fighters uh, had followed. And then even if we were caught, we would say we have never seen them. So we feel we, and we are very proud that we had something small to do in bringing up independence. And I think um, it is something that women need to be credited about. The ability and the courage to keep confidence and to, keep the, to supply the, the resources that were necessary the food, the water, and so forth, and to remain to the cause without having to trouble. I grew up uh, as a child of uh, a church minister of an independent church. The independent church is unique in that it also participated in the design of the movement for change of the, the leadership of the colonial government uh, because Certain tribes like the Kikuyus were not supposed to go to school and therefore they started their own schools and my father was uh, privileged to start the school and also to, to be able to start the churches. And um, I'm, I'm happy to say that um, although we lost him because he preached, um, he followed the Bible and told the, the church that fighting for independence and fighting for the land and the resources that are taken is a right and it was biblical and for that he was buried alive. We lived without our father but our mother was a champion of human rights. We worked very hard and uh, we managed to go to school. Um, and in the school I think there are some qualities that you learn from the beginning, the quality, the virtues of charity, the virtues of giving, the virtues of serving, the virtues of 
serving without any expectation the virtues of uh, patience that you learned during that period when there was that struggle for independence. And in the school, you also kept quiet because you didn't want to say who you were. At least people will come and find you because they also killed your father. So you lived with certain degree of fear, but we also had a lot of confidence because we saw things happen even under the circumstances. And in the school, I, I went there as an as a, as a independent church follower, but it was a Catholic school and I changed uh, because I believed that was the historical uh, church. And I read and I decided to change. And I even became a catechist during holidays. So I would mobilize people to the level where the, the, the bishop would always quote, please try to do like Terry. Everybody can do like Terry. And although that time I was shy about it, now I look back and I think, hey, maybe I was doing something. So um, at the age, at a very young age, also after uh, the, the, the ordinary levels of high, high education, a Catholic nun asked me if we, I could join her, I think I was 17, 18, to start what we call Women Union for Social Action. I think Odilia had mentioned about it. And um, it was a movement for women emanc emancipation, women and girls emancipation. At that time, we did not use the words empowerment and we do not use the word strengthening because culturally, you empower women to do what? To compete with the men. That, those concepts do not, did not arise. So it was women's emancipation. And it was interesting because I grew in that and I grew knowing that there were gaps in the society and that I could do something. I, I could help an old person who had jiggers or who didn't have water or who needed certain things to be done. And as a group, we went house to house during holidays and any time we had a free time to help. And also we taught them how to read and write. And not that we were very educated, but we gave what we had. Here the principle is give with all your heart, whatever you have, whatever you know, without expecting that one day you'll be a graduate and therefore you give. You give at the time, at a material time when people need it. So I think I grew in that movement and uh, I was lucky because I managed also to travel at a very young age to represent the youth in, in my country. And I thank God about that. And then towards the end, I went to Holland also to study. And after I studied, I came back and I that time, I hear of unemployment. At that time, we didn't have unemployment for educated people because the government sought for us. They asked you, we have these ministries, where are you going? And it happened that I was given the responsibility. The first assignment was to deal with international casework or the Asians were, were to return to uh, England or well, whoever, whatever they wanted and the Britain, did not want to welcome more Asians. So my case work was for Goan uh, families and also for the Asian uh, people who had relatives in Britain. So we had to correspond. And I thought that was interesting and challenging. And then it is during the same thing that uh, the first national, not that I had a lot of experience and networking and support and also seeking and working in team because I think that's very important. Uh, we managed to, to, to bring in to bear the policies that are governed up to date. Um, then I was appointed to go to the field uh, to establish uh, the welfare programs for women and I think I learned a lot. It was 
very difficult to help women because of the social, cultural, and traditional norms that existed in most societies that the girls did not have to go to school. They were very limited and people sang our names because we had gone to school and we had even graduated. That was very unique. So by establishing women group concept, it was now to make sure that individual women can join and get strength from each other without having to confront and bring conflict at the family level. And uh, that is where we are talking about the Mabat women group. And uh, they, we say the, 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 there were two objectives, the three objectives, I think. We made them, they should have uh, measurable objectives and they were very specific. And the first one was to remove the, the roof, the grass roof. The women in that area, region, uh, were in charge of roofing the houses, not the men. And there were insects that would drop when you were cooking. And so this time we wanted to remove that and put the mabati uh, on the roof and it worked. And I think it has, it worked like everything else. It is everywhere in Kenya now. People always have those groups and uh, uh, it's amazing how when a good idea comes, it is actually taken by the majority of people. There were a lot of uh, uh, problems in terms of changing the attitudes of men towards women, changing the attitudes of women towards themselves. And the way they had to go, and then we used the songs. We would get the women to organize for the songs to ensure that those songs reflected on the solidarity of the family, within the family. So that it doesn't look, because the men were saying, uh, now uh, the, men, the women are building the houses, who are they? And we do know of a case where uh, a man decided to burn the house uh, because it is not him who had constructed. So towards the end, we said song, song. So when the men would hear the song saying, this group you are finding here and it is activities, it is an effort, uh, and it is an effort for the man and the woman. So we would give credit to men even when they deserved nothing. And I think that was very nice of them because they would say, hey, these ones are not even competing. They are part of us. It was a strategy. So uh, then after several years, we had also the integrated rural development where we learned a lot to use the resources in one place to pull the resources together as government and NGOs and, um, and, and make it happen because we are serving the same client. And I think it is at that time when perhaps the government thought I could even do more and they appointed me to establish the Women's Bureau. The Women's Bureau was an idea that was promoted through the International Women's Year by the United Nations and all countries agreed that there should be national machineries for women, to, for integration of women in development. And uh, that was in 1975. And I'm glad that that happened because to date at least we have a state department on women, on gender. I think we can see we bear we, the fruits that were born to, uh, towards those efforts. And our job was to make the policies and to sensitize the people and to train the women and also to bring women into leadership of all levels. And our approach was bottom up in terms of mobilization. We decided that we needed not just the women who are educated, but we needed to reach out to the poor and to the rural women who are helpless and who needed to be organized and also to be trained given capacity of leadership so that they could uh, uh, address their own uh, affairs. And we are happy that happened and it has it continues to happen. And I think in terms of service, I have I have assisted to form to form a many 
uh, voluntary organizations that were supporting women. I did not just stick to the government, but politically, we would find a gap and we found it was necessary to address it. For example, the women were not being elected in, in, in positions. And we decided we should form the, uh, the League of Women Voters to make sure that women can vote and can vote the women in and that they have confidence and that we increase the number of women leaders in, 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 in parliament, the local government and whatever. And then um, we also did other initiatives uh, like the income generating, we did the research and so forth and so on. So the work has been uh, gratifying and what I have found is that uh, there is always a price you pay uh, for whatever you want to do. Uh, in whatever job you do, there is a gain. You, you, you may give, but you also receive a lot. It has made me who I am. The work I have done has made me who I am and do, I think. Uh, this exposure was extremely necessary. And I know that um, we have to be patient when we want to achieve something and we have to be more strategic. And I think we learned through doing and through giving and through the service. I, what I found was that there was no time limit of you are starting at eight to five. You worked and you carried the work home. And you worked on Saturday and you worked on Sunday. And you did not expect additional assistance. And you did not also expect people to tell you thank you. And what I have learned is that give service without expectation. And for the youth, I would say it will be very necessary that uh, we, they do not only go for things that bring gratification, immediate gratification, because that tends to be now the impression <coughs> of people are in a hurry to be rich, people are in a hurry to compete, people are in a hurry to be selfish, people are in a hurry to control their resources and not to share. And I would say, I think we need to go back to the African traditions, African culture and, 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 and values and you see the value of working and giving service to other people and also of sharing and also of sweating. Work for what you get so that you are not tempted to scheme around, to steal, to use corrupt means to get where you want to get so that you are like so-and-so. I think um, I would say that there is no harm in uh, in giving the services because by so doing you also learn a lot you learn a lot by giving by talking to other people by helping by giving them a hand by feeling in a gap and you feel content and whole thank you thank you terry i have one question for you mm -hmm. you know the the parenting nowadays, especially in Africa, has changed. Mm. Uh, how do you see the parenting of today? And what advice would you give to parents in order to, to, to bring up responsible citizens mm. and, and citizens of service, citizens who know it is important to to see my brother the way I see myself, because I noticed that we are now lacking that, especially in Africa. I, I think it is, it is a very serious uh, observation. Um, we are lost. I, I would say we are totally lost and we don't have um, the, the foundation that you need. Uh, Traditionally, we are groomed. If I saw an old person uh, carrying something, I would help. If I saw an old person walking through a path, I would give way. We knew service from the, the time we were small. These days, it is so capitalistic perfected. 
that it is me and me and me. But you know, if th this will also not lead us anywhere because we need, we are walking like we are naked without the values, without traditions, without uh, pride of our culture, of our background, without understanding where we are going, except you want material. The emphasis, too much emphasis on material. And I would tell the parents that they have to know their children and they have to keep close to their children and they have to give them advice and to give them a hand. They have to tell them what is right and what is wrong. What is acceptable, what is not acceptable. Um, they, they, they have to tell them the value of work and the value of service. And that it is not just a question of accumulation of materials, but also sharing and also working hard is very important. And not just copying. Sometimes I feel we have copied too much of the Western culture. And we are lost in between sitting two different stools, sometimes three, because there is three of the competition. <laughs> and I think, I think then you feel sorry because you can see these people, the, the, the young people are very weak and the parents are even weaker because you give what you have. And if we do not teach our, our girls, our, our young men, how to bring up a child in honesty, with integrity, hard work, and also service, values of service, I think then uh, I would say we are also, I would advise that uh, the parents focus on that and that uh, there is no harm of also teaching them your language, your mother's language. And I think the more languages you know, the better. So, but you do not have to dismiss all your vernacular languages because of one international language and uh, you can't even gossip with it because everybody knows it. Right. Thank you so much. You have touched on uh, so many issues that we are uh, dealing with there. Eh? In the, here in the diaspora, you have touched about language, culture, history. And I think these are the things that have made, uh, that ground you, especially as an African person. And this culture of ours, we, we also want to share it with the, with the African people of descent, of uh, people of African descent um, in the diaspora. And it is, it, is, it is nice to hear that our culture is valuable. Thank you for confirming that. Haki, Kim. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mother Curry. We appreciate you joining us from Kenya. We appreciate you. Bao Mao, United States, uh, many uh, Pan-African leaders admired and respected the work of the Mao Mao uh, for years. And there are quite a few songs <laughs> about the Mao Mao and, you know, many people uh, salute the Mao Mao in the United States. So very pleased that you've been able to join us and share uh, your historical context for that. So I just want to read some of the comments. Uh, I believe this is a brother or sister, I apologize. In Joki de Dakara says, my mother was a village woman without education, but took up with women's groups. So thank you, uh, brother or sister, I'm sorry. In, in Joke, in Joke. So we appreciate your comments uh, with that. So, uh, my name is Bonface. I'm best of in Nairobi, Kenya. I am an artist uh, working at intersection of arts and peace building and social justice and uh, trauma healing work. I'm based in Nairobi, but 
I operate across different African nations. I'm also a cultural advocate. So it's a great pleasure and privilege to be in this space. Thank you very much. Dr. Remy Duyale, uh, she is in the United States. Uh, she's in the Prince George's County area and she is a candidate for uh, a House of Delegates seat, but she is of Nigerian descent. All right, thank you so much, Brother Aki and Sister Terry. Thank you for this platform. And thank you all for all that you're doing. I was listening to our mother speaking and I was like, yes, speak on. Those are the days, the good old days, I would call it. I grew up in Nigeria for 17 years of my life before I moved here 39 years ago. And what mother said is exactly how it was, where you know your elders are there, you're just jumping to help people without expectation because helping was expected. You dare not think of helping people. You dare not be a young person, near an elderly person and not offer to help. Your mother or your dad, I know my mama will pop me in the head or in the mouth, or, or whoop out a cake. So I pray and hope that we can bring this back. And mother said it all. We parents have to be bold enough to continually speak to our children. They're our children. It doesn't matter how rich or smart they think they are. Guess what? They do listen. They might not want to act like they do. So I, I just was so amazed and happy that mother was going to that lane and reminding us as parents to be fully engaged and never to be a, a spectator in our children's lives. I pray that in this nation that we do the same. And that's one of the reasons that I'm raising my hand to run for office and be a representation in Annapolis where we can bring some newness, some authentic narratives to the legislative matters that concerns us, especially in this great state of Maryland. We have a lot, a lot to give as African born and our brothers and sisters here in America, they are our brothers and sisters and together we can, we can rub ideas off of each other. And mother, you spoke well. Sister, thank you for this great platform. And brother Akeem, thank you. He's our campaign manager. And when you're looking for someone who truly gives without expectation. Uh, Brother Aki mirrors that in every ramification. So thank you all very much for giving me this opportunity and uh, I'm enjoying myself, so I'll stay on. Thank you. Well, well Rick, um, so let's give out your, your contact information for those okay. who may not know. Um, and, you know, just share just, just why you decided uh, to, to run for office. Let's, you know, just try to Plug, you're from Nigeria, you know, you, but you lived here uh, 40, 39 years. So what did you see and why would you consider getting involved in politics in a country that you weren't born in? Sure. Thank you so much. Um, and you've said it all. I've uh, been here for 39 years. And wherever you have been for 39 years, you're not a stranger anymore. And coming here, I came in quest okay. of education. Okay. And education I got, I was able to get education that allowed me to start my corporation and my corporate life with an MBA. I started as a teller in, in a banking institution, one of the top five in this country. And with four strikes, I rose to a vice president position. These were things that motivated me to know that, you know what, when you give your best, best will come to you. Was it easy? No, it wasn't. Black, female, Nigerian accent. I had to deal with all the strikes in everything I do. And as you all can hear, none of those things you choose. And I'm so proud of it. But people had issues with it. And Brother mm. Aki, you said it. What gives me the audacity to want to run? Not being born here and now I'm here. But guess what? Because I've seen that to whom much is given, much is expected. And because I know that until we truly incorporate and integrate each other's culture the way that is meant to be, that the black and brown race, we would not have the empowerment and the freedom that we desire and the, that we deserve. So me sitting and just watching and, and hoping things would happen without raising my hand and sitting at the table is unacceptable. I've raised three amazing children here in America and they are doing well, but by God's grace, they're all the children I teach also at a university. So my life is a totally about development. 
It's totally about service because I know that their shoulders I'm leaning on. People who didn't know me in this country, who gave me a shoulder to lean on. And now that I've leaned on the shoulder, I've learned, I've earned, I've got a return to serve in a way that I can influence other people to know that together they can be, they can do much more. And the small businesses as an entrepreneur, I want to be able to make sure that all of our small businesses have a seat at the table. When I say a seat at the table, it means their voices will be heard, not that they will come and be at the table exactly with me, but their voices will be heard because I will go to the grassroots and ensure that there are no little people in my books. Everybody has a gift and that gift we will pull out. So small businesses, our seniors, our elders, they've got wisdom, they've got experience, they've got expertise. I'm going to ensure that our seniors are put to work in a nice way that they mentor our young leaders. Even though seniors are there, they're not, they're not tired, they might be retired. So we're going to go back to the old school of ensuring that our seniors are cared for and that we learn from their knowledge to ensure that our young leaders, I see them in the classroom from the beginning to the end for the semester. I see how we start and I see how we end. When they know you care about them, they will go the extra mile all the time. So we can never give up on our young leaders because the work is in our hands to ensure how to show them how to love and care. And that's what we bring in the classroom, especially for the HBCU, which is one of the schools that I teach at. So that's why I'm running to go back, go to the seat and be able to make impact legislatively that will come back to our community. And my community where I'm, I'm running at, we are predominantly black and brown. We're, we're, we're the most affluent African uh, American community in the whole of the United States. And so I, that gives me the audacity to know that we can open up the continent and, and leverage each other because people would rather do business with people that look like them. And our African-American brothers came here to set the stage for us. If they didn't set the stage, I would not have the audacity to run. They have set the stage. So now we can together take the knowledge that I have gained in America, the upbringing that I was brought up in my home country to now go to the table and say, you know what, together we can do it better. And that's what I'm hoping to do. And I ask that you all visit my website. I'm going to put it on the chat, voteremyjulia.com. Keep us in your prayers. If you're led to serve, please volunteer to help us make some phone calls. If you would like to donate, whatever you're led to do, this is a movement about us, not for me, not for any particular reason, but for service. Pure service is why I'm doing this. Thank you so much, Sister Terry, Brother Aki. Thank you so much for giving me this platform to speak. Yeah. Today is an incredible day. Uh, Martin Luther King, a lot of people in the U.S., they see him as docile. Um, they see him uh, as a nonviolent man, uh, but there was such strength that came from his ability uh, to stand in the face of monsters and still be human. And this day of service is to acknowledge that African people are the quintessential human beings. Uh, we've always been human and we demonstrate our humanity through our service. Thank you so much, Mama Terry for coming and telling us about your life and service, one that hasn't ended, you're still serving. And I appreciate that it gives me as a woman, a young woman, something to look forward to. It doesn't end, this is a lifelong journey, um, this life of service. And today's event, connecting civil rights to human rights, reminds us of our humanity that it's beyond the small, liberties that have been given to Black people in this country. Today's MLK International Day of Service is beyond defunding the police and campaigns in the streets and the right to raise your voice to march in the name of Black Lives Matter movements. It's so far beyond that because it is about us being African being the quintessential human beings, being the first, being the original, demonstrating to the world the standard of humanity. That is what today is about. And so I thank you, Odilia, for joining me, Shiro, in this plight to remind us again of our role as the mother of civilization to establish and continually reestablish and affirm our humanity.
And hopefully our world, <laughs> the one that we've birthed, will come into alignment under mamas like Mama Terry, under your leadership, Odilia. You know, you getting up there, sis. <laughs> I'm telling on you, you look great. <laughs> but I'm telling you, Odilia is an elder in the making. Yes, sis, we look up to you. We're humbled by your service to community, promoting and preserving the African identity through language. That is important to define for ourselves who we are in our own language. That is important service to our community. And I have the privilege of introducing to you Mama Oya Bibi. She has also done years of service, not just to my people here in this tribe in the US, but all across the Pan-African community, especially in Liberia. Mama Oya Bibi, are you with us? Yes, I am. I am so sorry. What a mix up. My goodness. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm here. No problem. Can Thank you hear you me? for being here? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you so much for being here with us as a brilliant example of the service oriented spirit that we all need to serve our communities. And um, as the mother of civilization, I give you the mic and the floor. Please educate. All right. So I, I just learned about TAI yesterday. Um, I heard from Kim. I got back to Kim and we had a great conversation. I told her my history of having immigrated to Liberia, West Africa with my family, five children and my husband in 1985. And we stayed in Liberia. Um, I've always been an activist. Um, and I didn't want to leave, but because of racism, we lost our fifth child um, because we were rejected at a hospital in South Carolina where we were traveling on vacation. So it was pretty intense for me. I could not get over that. Um, racism is hard enough to get over. It's one thing to see Emmett Till killed when you're a little kid like I did, but to see it up close and personal and have it affect you um, changes your life. Um, and it changed my life. I think I, I, um, I grew up, I, I was so hurt. So then um, we decided to leave a prosperous business, a wonderful community in Miami, Florida that we had pulled together because of our business. Um, everybody would join up at our business, Kwanzaa, different holidays, different meetings, African dancing. Um, we sold African clothes, we made jewelry. I'm a goldsmith. Um, and so we packed up and left Miami and moved to Liberia. Um, there had been a coup in Liberia, but I didn't know about it. There was a lot of information I did not know about Liberia. Um, and you can read up on it. Liberia historically is connected to African-Americans, Caribbeans, and of course the indigenous people that were there before we returned. Because we were scattered when we came here during enslavement, when we were going back, we didn't know where we came from. Um, the United States was trying to get rid of us. The American Colonialization Society was trying to get rid of us. Um, those of us who were already free in the 1820s, who already had either purchased our freedom, uh, lived in the North or otherwise, we were an ugly sore. We were the attraction for runaways like Harriet Tubman we were um, an enticement to freedom. People could see us and be, be um, see us free on the street, but they were enslaved. And so um, they wanted to get rid of us. That was the plan under James Monroe. Just get rid of them, send them back to Africa, the free ones. Um, and so free and still enslaved were returned and they chose Sierra Leone, Britain chose Sierra Leone and what became Sierra Leone, I wanna get this very, very clear. People lived there before, Liberia was not founded. Liberia was um, people came from the United States, African-Americans um, that had transformed over 200 years, came to Liberia um, to settle. And I, that's the best explanation I can give. In that settling, they created, they created a, 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 a country a name, a country that recognized by 1847 by the world. 
especially European world. The United States wasn't ready for it. Um, but the United States was giving support, helping us move there. And unfortunately, they had already convinced and brainwashed us. I think for any of you who are what we call woke, you know that once a person is brainwashed, according to Carter G. Woodson, you can, um, you can tell us to come through the back door. And even when we're free, we still seek to enter through the back door. And so some of the people that went there, they were so thoroughly indoctrinated that they continued to perpetuate um, some of the things that they had been taught, some of the things that they were used to. Um, they did form a republic. They did great things. They were able to feed themselves, or we, I should say. I want you to see Liberians as your cousins because they were already enslaved. They were already, um, mis what do you call it, misogynation. Um, and they were already um, ready to embrace Christianity, um, Western ways, um, to support the United States. Anyone who knows about Liberia knows that the flag looks like the American flag, it's red, white, and blue, that the constitution is actually pretty much the same. Um, but they were not fools. One of the things in that constitution says, only people of African descent can become citizens of Liberia. And many people have tried to get uh, Liberia to change that clause in their constitution, they will not. Um, at least they have not, and I hope they do not. So Liberia was able to pretty much feed itself up until the 70s. Um, and they got a new president in the um, 19, I think 79, yeah. Um, Tubman um, was the president for I think 26 years. He died um, unexpectedly and his vice president, Mr. Tolbert became president. Tolbert was trying very hard um, from what I've read, I wasn't there, um, to stop the importation of, of rice. Liberian farmers were growing rice. Liberian farmers were feeding themselves. Liberian fishermen, um, cattlemen were taking care of those things. We didn't need a lot of importation, but Firestone was importing rice and they um, got the Liberian public to mm, become endeared to that rice. So sadly, a lot of importation was coming in and it was cheaper. You could produce it cheaper. You could import it cheaper than you could produce it. And so Tubman, um, Tolbert, sorry, was raising the price of rice so that the importation could not continue, that the local rice would be more acceptable. And the local rice, what we call country rice, if it hasn't been milled uh, to death, to whiteness, um, has a red covering on it and is very, very healthy and very, very tasty. So that's what his plan was. I'm not sure of the other politics, so I won't try to be an expert, but in 1979, I believe it was, Tolbert was assassinated. Um, I feel it was outside interference. He was assassinated. The indigenous people took over, which I thought was a good thing. I just didn't know what assassination meant. I was very, very naive. And so we, when we moved there, I knew nothing about the um, the coup, except to know that William Tolbert was gone and the indigenous people were finally going to have some rights in Liberia. Liberia used to be called a, a country of apartheid. We knew about um, we knew about South Africa. Everybody did. What's interesting about Liberia is although it was called a country of apartheid, under Tubman, the president who was there for so long, he had begun to do what he called integration and Tolbert was carrying it further. So we are very connected. Martin Luther King was very, very instrumental in changing the minds of the way Liberians were treating the indigenous people or Americo Liberians they're called sometime, Congo people they're called sometime. Um, the people that ended up form forming Liberia are West Indians, many from um, Barbados, um, African Americans, many from the United States, and also people who, because enslavement ended in Europe at a certain point, I'm not sure of the date, but if you were on a ship as an enslaved person heading to the West, the British captured those ships. They took the people off those ships and they dumped them in Liberia 
on the coast. Okay, so those they always call Congo people. Um, so in 1985, here comes my family. We moved there, lock, stock, and barrel. We carried all of our money, um, closed our business, packed up our, um, put our stuff in storage, and, and we moved to Liberia. And we were very happy um, having homeschooled our children, having home birthed our children, except for the one that was lost, um, and being very self-reliant. Um, we opened a small school. I got invited to teach at a local school. I accepted, I went there. Um, we had five children at that time. All of our children went to that school. I was able to participate fully. Um, and we were living a really good life. We didn't interact with people from the embassy. We didn't interact um, in Liberia with people from the USAID and other um, official, they call them official Americans, which is such an ugly word. Um, we didn't really go there for that. We went there to interact with Liberians to see how we could um, integrate into the country. But we had, we were still so naive. We didn't realize that tribalism, as in the United States, colorism, um, economicism, all of those things existed in Liberia. So we were put into a box. We were put into a square, we're a circle and we were put into a square peg because it's like, well, you can't, you can't integrate with the indigenous people. Um, and um, the indigenous people, the people that we met who the, the original people, um, you know, some were ready to work with us and some weren't. Um, so five years we lived in what I would call utopia. I used to have to wake up and pinch myself. Anyone who's moved to Africa, um, it is such a different place. It, 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 for me, it is such a welcoming place. Um, there, was, there were opportunities where I wasn't welcome, but generally speaking, that had to do with colorism. I was told at one point um, by one of the teachers in the school who thought she was helping me, she said to me, why are you here? Why do you dress like an African? They really don't want you here. And I said, well, they really don't want me there. So I am here to stay and nothing is chasing me out. And so I ignored the, the ones who didn't want me there. And I, and I worked with the people who did. I became friendly um, with many, many people, a couple of African-Americans, but basically, unless you were an African-American married to a Liberian who understood and didn't criticize the local people, um, I, I would be a friend to you. I would participate with you. I am a Muslim, so I was the head of the Muslim women's group for a while. Um, I did whatever I could to help um, wake people up. I stopped people from calling me Negro. When I got to Liberia, anybody from the United States was called a Negro. They didn't know what else to call us. They had to give us a try. And so they used the word Negro, which used to offend me so much because in the 70s, we murdered Negro. We threw it in the ground and buried it. We were black people. We were African Americans, or we were Africans. And so many times I would have to say, "Please don't call me that." Um, I don't think it offended anyone, but I don't think they understood why I didn't want to be called that. And I didn't have much time. Um, I think in um, maybe 1987 or 88, I was invited by Visiki Kone, who are not a lot of you may know. He is from Liberia, he's a Liberian, um, to speak at the Malcolm X um, special program. I was honored, I went there and I spoke, he did some news articles and we became very good friends. He's very, very popular on Facebook. He's visiting Africa right now. Um, but something happened in 1989 on December 25th and that changed our relationship to Liberia, the working. Um, Charles Taylor and Prince Johnson um, invaded uh, Liberia. They are both Liberians. Charles Taylor appears to be a mixed Liberian, American Liberian and indigenous. And Prince Johnson is an indigenous Liberian soldier. They invaded Liberia while everybody was kind of drunk, I guess, celebrating Christmas across the Ivory Coast border. Um, we heard about it, we ignored it. We hoped it would just go away. We thought it would end like 1980, the coup would told it, but it did not. Um, within, um, I would say six months, 
the invasion um, was in the capital city. The stories were horrendous. Americans and Europeans alike were fleeing Liberia. They were, um, they were getting out of there. Um, we sent our kids to my mother and my husband and I decided to stay in Liberia, to stay there. That was our home. You can imagine if someone was invading the state you live in, the city you live in, the country you live in, would you just get up and leave? Um, and so, no, we didn't leave. We stayed. And we were there for over six years, almost seven years of that war. We thought it would end. I am writing a book um, because I kept journals and my journals kept saying, oh, it's going to end tomorrow. <laughs> it's going to end. You know, they're having peace talks. Um, but what I did instead of leave is I came back to the United States. I got my children. I took them back to Liberia. Um, so there were seven of us living in our home. Um, when the soldiers, Prince Johnson soldiers, marched down our road, um, the people came out and cheered them because they felt they were going to remove President Doe, the one that was a part of the assassination of Tolbert, and things were going to be better for Liberians. I wasn't sure how to take it when they first came. We called them freedom fighters um, until the stories started coming out about the murders and the atrocities of different tribes. So Prince Johnson and Charles Taylor, to make the story short, they began to fight each other. Um, there was a lot of outside interference. And I think if you're talking about nationhood, if you're talking about unity, you have to recognize that people will infiltrate people who look like you, people who feel like you, people who you love may infiltrate and who cares if they infiltrate, but they will cause dissension. They will turn you against yourself, not to mention people who are close to you. And so in Liberia, Prince Johnson and Charles Taylor separated and both of them turned into two warring factions against each other, killing each other's family members in different parts of the country, killing Muslims, killing other tribes. Prince Johnson killing Taylor's tribe, Taylor killing Prince Johnson's tribe. Um, and there were bodies in the street. I, I just, I'm a, I'm a I'm, if you see my head shaking at all, it's because I'm a basket case. I came out of there crazy. Um, but I just couldn't leave. I couldn't leave. Um, I wouldn't leave. I didn't want to leave. So I began to travel back and forth to the United States, trying to build an advocacy for Liberia. One thing that happened very quickly, and I warrant all of you know how to grow food, keep stores, that when, and we saw it with COVID, when the shit hits the fan, excuse my language, food is the first thing to go. And it was gone. Within two weeks, according to my journals, there was no food left. And I'm, I'm not talking about supermarkets. People were running in droves. They would travel out of Monrovia the capital city where I live near to, I'm six miles outside, and they would run. And they would, you'd see pictures of them with the loads on their head and babies on their backs and grandmothers in wheelbarrows. It was the most pitiful thing you ever wanted to see. And they would walk for days and days to get to areas that there was no war. Um, and so the war intensified in, in Monrovia. Sometimes we thought, we, my husband and I and the kids, we were going to die. Um, but we were prepared for that eventuality. Um, and um, whatever I say about people who make those kind of decisions, the word consistency and dedication has to be a part of that. If you're not ready to get down and dirty, you shouldn't be doing this work. You shouldn't be thinking about moving to Africa. If you're not willing to um, accept what you find in Africa, that's not like you then you're not ready to be there. Um, I was ready for all those things, but not as ready as I thought, because I just didn't know. I just didn't know. And as I write this book, as I look at my journals, I can see how naive, how naive and unknowing I was. But what is the benefit of being naive? The benefit of being na naive is that you have faith and you have a lot of trust in what you think you believe and what you think you know. And so for me, um, if it was naivete, that still has me 36 years, I believe, still doing this work, um, then it's okay to be naive. It's better than being a smart aleck and thinking you know everything and then ending up um, sitting down. It can't be done. 
Can't is not a part of my vocabulary. Can't should not be a part of your vocabulary. I taught my children, don't use that word. There's nothing you cannot do. You may not do it because it won't work, but you don't say you can't do it. You can, you just have to put it together and put one foot in front of the other and make it happen. So within two years, I had come back and forth to the United States. I shipped containers of food. I shipped um, toys for kids. I shipped clothes and medicines um, with the help of some of my New York, former New York um, colleagues. And I realized three years down the road that I had spent all of our money and that I really wasn't ending the war. People like Randall Robinson, Jesse Jackson, all of them wouldn't even answer the phone to talk to me. Um, nobody supported me when I came to New York, except one man who's some more marksman. He had a show on WBAI. All the others just turned their back on me. I really, really think that the United States put out a word, don't deal with her. I can't say that for sure, but the way people treated me that should have known me, I'm from Brooklyn. I went to Brooklyn College. Um, it was pretty harsh. I was already traumatized, my children in Africa. One of the attacks that came in 1982, um, my husband had to drag the children. They slept on the floor in the embassy and the embassy kept saying, we can put you on a plane, but you can't stay here. And so he took the children back to the house. Um, and we had a visitor who insisted on going to Liberia during 1992, what we call octopus. Um, he got out of there. He took a helicopter and left when we had that huge attack, but we did not. We've been armed robbed during the war. My husband was beaten, my son was beaten. Um, our payroll was stolen. Um, I incorporated when I came to the United States in 1991. Um, by 1993, I opened a clinic in Liberia. Um, a lot of displaced people had been um, taken up residence next to a piece of land I own. I had nothing on the land, um, but I had a project that I got money from the United Nations and from a group called IFESH under Reverend Sullivan, about mm, $40,000. And I decided I was going to build for the refugees, the internally placed refugees, um, chicken houses, distribute chickens, distribute tools for farming, teach urban gardening, which I was learning on the fly, um, and also meet the needs, the health needs of the people in the displaced camp. So I went to the UN and I asked them for a tent and they gave me a tent, I opened the tent and we began to offer, and I hired a nurse and we began to offer healthcare. Um, today, I'll cut it short, I don't wanna bore you too much, but today, um, well, let's go back to that time. During that time, we did teach those things, we did give out tools, we did deal with the UN, we did begin to build a center for democracy and development that was going to be a school um, for Liberian adults. Um, and we did build those chicken houses in many places, went to other areas and wherever we can get money, we, we gave out supplies, we gave out shoes, we gave out um, slippers. Um, we gave out lots and lots of food that we could get our hands on from the um, food programs. And we started a soybean project where we were going to use soybeans for um, feeding, fertilizing the soil and also um, feed, feeding in the schools as well as introduce it because people didn't eat soybeans in Liberia. And so I had some training in that in Nigeria and I took that back to Liberia and it was really growing. But in 1996, we had another of those horrendous invasions. Um, by this time we had a clinic, the clinic had been attacked already, um, but we were still there with Liberians, all Liberians running the clinic. We had a little farm um, on my land. We um, helped the people in the displaced. And then um, in 1996, um, July, April, I'm sorry, the city was attacked by Charles Taylor. Charles Taylor is known, his soldiers are known for indiscipline for um, the kind of misery they can inflict on the public, um, on civilians. A lot of civilians died. Um, few soldiers compared to civilians um, were killed, murdered brutally. Some of my friends murdered brutally, you know, babies cut out of women's stomachs. You have to know what black on black crime is about when people start talking about, well, what about white on white crime? I'm sorry, yes, there's white on white crime, there's Bosnia, but I'm interested in what we're doing to each other. Um, and so it was, it was people 
the wonderful Liberian people who are friendly, easy to get along with, very, very compassionate. To see them doing these things, it just broke my heart. It made me lose my trust in humankind. They were, some of these boys were forced into being soldiers. They were drugged. Um, they had a free reign on cocaine, I believe, and marijuana. And they were doing things that they wouldn't normally do. It ruined a whole generation of young boys, boy soldiers from 12, 13, 14, 15. It was just horrible. Everything was horrible, except the opportunity to help somebody else. And so we have the clinic and we're running the clinic and it, it was going, going very well. We got a little bit of money to pay people. I mean, really small. My salary was $200 a month, um, which I mostly used to help feed people and do what I could for my own children. Um, and so in 96, when we had that April invasion, um, we stayed, we decided to stay. My husband went into the city. He worked for the UN at that time because we needed the money. Um, he went into the city and I never saw him again until we left Liberia. We would um, put a huge stove at the door at night. The soldiers were coming, Taylor soldiers were coming. They were going house to house. They were murdering, they were raping. My girls were teenagers now. Um, and they were killing the occupants and taking whatever else they wanted. Um, and so after six days and hiding a young man in my home who they were looking to kill, his sister, um, after six days, um, we saw a, an embassy truck outside of our house heading into a gated compound. I didn't live in a gated house. And my children called me to go speak with them. They turned out to be embassy people and they had soldiers in the back of their truck. And they said, we're here to pick up Americans. And my daughter told them, but we're American. I never used that word the whole time I lived in Liberia. I was a Liberian as far as I was concerned, um, but I did want to get my girls out of there. So I told the man I would send the kids and he said he was going into compound. When he came back, he would, he would pick the kids up. I put the kids in the car when he came back and I, I went on my porch and I began to cry. And he came to the porch and he said to me, don't cry, we won't leave you. We won't leave you. And I think uh, either the best of intentions, God or whatever you want to call it, came to me and said, get out of there. Get out of there now. So we only could carry one bag. I grabbed the food that my daughter had on the stove, put it in the car. And they took us to a huge, uh, not the Freeport, but another open area and just dumped us there. No food. We didn't know when we were leaving. It was raining. Um, my children slept on the ground. Um, my baby, my youngest, slept in um, one of the UN people's trucks in the back. Um, and by the next day, the helicopter started coming to pick people up to take you out. Um, we had no money. Um, my husband, I'd not seen him. Um, I didn't know where he was. The last time I'd heard from him, they were breaking into his office, the soldiers. And then his radio went dead. We're both amateur radio operators. And so I have the right and the license to be on those UN and whoever got a radio, I can be on it um, and I can hear them. Um, and so I didn't hear from him, but it was mainly to get the five kids out. And so we got to Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone turned the, the helicopter away. They took us to Senegal. And in Senegal, um, we met some Liberians who gave us a place to stay. And then we rented a place. I refused to leave Senegal because I'm going back to Liberia, mind you. Um, people that worked for me went to stay in my house. They thought it might be safe. Um, and when we got news that the house had been broken in, they were chased out. Everything had been removed. Um, we knew that we could not go back. And so I came back to New York, um, put my children with my mother who lived in Pennsylvania. The clinic remained open um, once the, that heavy fighting stopped, but that heavy fighting took two months. It just, it just was horrific. It was the worst fighting that had entered the capital city. Prince Johnson could have fought Charles Taylor, but the peacekeepers had neutralized Prince Johnson, so he could not fight Taylor. And Taylor did what we call a bloodletting. He, people just did everything. Had we been there, we may have died. 
um, or been brutally hurt. So it was good that we left. Um, we reopened the clinic. Um, Taylor became president because people were tired of fighting. Our clinic has is still open, serves about 14 to 18,000 people a year. Um, very, very low cost or no cost. Um, adult literacy is one of my specialties. And so we've always had adult literacy program. We started another one um, for displaced. And now we do adult literacy near markets. I think they'll show a film. I'm not sure of the video, a quick video that will show you some of what we've done. Um, and we're still there. During, during Ebola, two of my staff died or two of our family died because um, we are like very, um, or more like family than anything. Sometimes I do have to lay the law down, but generally speaking, I go back and forth. Mahmoud, um, my husband goes back and forth um, and we do the best we can. Um, we don't have a lot of money, um, but we do the best we can because I don't wanna let the staff down. We have about 28 staff in Liberia. When I came back to New York, I opened a program here. I have uh, 18 staff here in New York. We do after school programs and adult literacy. Can't is not a part of my, lingo, my, my, my language. It just, you can, you can do something. You don't have to do what I do. Um, you can do something, you can help somebody who needs it. You can go and volunteer in a hospital and talk to a kid or an elderly person. We all need to be doing something. I don't respect, I'm sorry to say, I don't have a lot of respect for people who don't do anything. And it's all about me. And all I can do is, um, you know, it's about me. I don't have time, I don't have money. I don't, I don't wanna be bothered with that. Um, more power to them. That's all I can say, more power to them. But after what you just heard, um, this is not a lie, this is true. Um, this to me is, not possible. That's the best thing I can say. It's not possible. It can't have happened, but it did. And it continues to happen. And I continue to get support from the universe. And um, when we're almost down and out and empty, run out of money, something comes from somewhere. Um, and you don't have to get old to do this. I was very young. When I got to Liberia, I was just 39 years old. I was a girl. Um, so, you know, it, it, you can do it. We can do it. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop here. Um, you know, I'm in New York right now. I hope to go to Liberia in March, stay for a couple of months to help train the staff in other ways. We also did a women, um, uh, Liberian women's health manual. We created it in a low literacy level so that it could be used for women in our literacy programs, um, which we are just reopening because we had run out of money. Um, we have a mobile ambulance, which is sitting because we don't have any money for the gas. Gas is expensive. But the clinic is open. The literacy classes will reopen. And we're working with the school to help some of the teenagers in that school, as well as the adults who want to learn to read. Liberia has 66% illiteracy. It's so sad. The governments tend to be extremely corrupt. And I'm not picking on any one government. I think all of the governments have tended to be very, very corrupt, um, you know, feeding their own pockets rather than taking care of the people. 66% illiteracy um, and 40%, I think, no, um, yeah, about 50 or 60% um, of the people live below the poverty line, way below the poverty line, which is now $1.90 a day if they're lucky. So that's, that's who I am. My name is um, Oya B.C. Eder Abdullah. Um, most people call me Sister B.C. Work with me or for me. And um, I hope I can live another hundred years. <laughs> so, so I can wow. continue to do this work. I can't afford to die. <laughs> another hundred years. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna shut up. <laughs> um, and thank you for listening for those of you that are there. Listen. Mama BC, it was a privilege for you to share your story with us today. When we talk about service, we're not playing. This work yeah. is serious. We've dedicated our lives to this. You've dedicated your life. And oh my God, if you don't live another hundred years, we don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> because who's going to replace you? Everybody that has stood up from our community 
to do it unapologet unapologetically without incentive have been assassinated. MLK, we praise him. We celebrate him. He was assassinated. Yes. Right now in Baltimore City, there's a young lady that was appointed as the state's attorney representative for Baltimore City, uh, Marilyn Mosby. And I'm not a politician. I'm an artist. But I am a taxpaying citizen of this city. And right now they're saying that she's indicted uh, because she, I don't know, took money from her 401k prematurely, something of that nature. And, you know, now everybody has a moral compass. Now everybody's so ethical and of good character. But where was that good character when they watched as Martin Luther King or even possibly arranged for Martin Luther King to be assassinated? Where was that good character when they allowed Liberia to kill each other? We, I mean, I just think that, uh, you know, this year, as we look at MLK's International Day of Service, we need to celebrate you, you and Mama Terry. We need to acknowledge people that have been doing this work, a thankless job for $200 a month, taking the money that should be for your own children's mouths and feeding other people. This work is serious and I'm so tired of people standing up being representatives for our communities to enrich and incentivize themselves when we need so very much, when we need so very much. And I just wanna thank you for being an example that we should all follow and for being a part of this international conversation connecting our global African narratives. Mama Terry is in East Africa. Odilia is in the Netherlands. You're in New York City, I'm here in Baltimore with Baba Haki. I mean, we're literally representing a nice population of global African people. We are speaking on behalf of half of the world of global African people. Our voices matter today and this today is powerful. It's powerful because we're all sincerely doing this work in service. And so on this day, I just want you guys to remember to be of good carriage, to keep and maintain your strength, and to network with somebody that you don't know here today. Please don't leave this call, this day of service and not connect with somebody new that you don't know. If you already know them, start a new project. We need network, we need family. We cannot do this service alone. And when we begin to work alone as individuals, adopting the European philosophy on how we should live and how we should work and not embracing our African identity and the African way and standard for humanity, that's when we become targets. We stay connected family, our mission, our vision will be realized. And it's because of the servants like you to that vision that we realign humanity by taking our place as the quintessential Africans and quintessential human beings. Thank you again for being with us today. We're gonna close out with a video from MLK just to acknowledge the fact that he lost his life in this struggle. Martin Luther King wasn't the only one. Malcolm X lost his life in this struggle. Many of the freedom fighters during the civil rights movement lost their lives during the struggle. And my grandmother is 90 years old. This wasn't so long ago. They tell us that we need to stand up and be citizens. And, you know, I, it just bothers me what's happening in our history right now. But now everybody has a compass. Everybody is so ethical. Everybody wants to, you know, right to the letter of the law. But that same law imprisoned me and my people. We weren't even considered human beings under the laws in this country. We weren't even human beings. And so I want to make sure that we never forget. How could we ever forget? especially when our struggle is still before us, when our struggle is still happening now. Thank you, I work in service to you all. I dedicated my life to this work, using art and culture to tell our stories and promote our vision, to build institutions that sustain us in the next generation. Baba Haki, I'll give it over to you. And thank can you I, all again for ask, being with us today. Uh, can I ask if the, the video is going to be shown or either one of the... 30 minutes, second videos will be shown about Imani House? Yes, that's the video that he's going to be showing now. He okay. has the link. Okay, and if I could just oh, throw wait. one thing in, I want everybody to be cognizant that Martin Luther King was not a danger until he interfered with Vietnam, until he began to go to Africa. Malcolm X really wasn't a threat until he began to talk about attending the United Nations to put the United States on trial for war crimes against us. So keep that in mind as you move about 
being international makes you a target. Um, I have no doubt that I am taped, monitored, watched, but what am I doing? I'm just trying to help people. Okay, thank you. What we have to do is create leaderless movements. The Teaching Artists Institute is so much bigger than me. We work in nine different countries, nine different countries. And I hope that one day somebody from one of those countries is gonna continue this work when I'm no longer able to. We work to build a strong foundation so that anyone that would dedicate their life to this work in service would have the opportunity to do that. And so please, please let us know if you wanna work. Go on our social media page, it's a tool. Is we don't own it, that's okay. It's a tool, send us a message. We'll respond to you. If you're ready to get a shovel and help us build this vision, you're welcome. Please let us know, www.facebook.com slash teaching artists, one word. Teaching artists, one word. And also go to the Imani House. I'm not sure, Miss Terry, if you have an initiative that's online, uh, but if you do, please feel free to come off mute and let us know. And um, uh, Mama, uh, please tell us if you have a website. I know the Imani House uh, does have a website, I believe, but if you also have social media, please let us know how we can contact you and how we can donate to support your efforts. Yes, uh, thank you. We have our website is www.imanihouse.org. Um, Facebook, we have an Imani House Facebook. We have an Imani House Instagram. Um, we don't have a lot of staff to manage it, but it's there. Um, I get a lot of following under Oya BC. If you put Oya BC into Facebook, you will find me. Um, and I post a lot of what you put up. I'll always post what you put up if it's progress. Okay, thank you. I wanna shout out to my Mama Shiro out of Cameroon. Thank you so much for being here, Auntie. We appreciate you uh, being here. Miss Celine is with us. Um, let's see if there anybody. Of course, Dr. Njadi was already acknowledged. And um, we have a couple other people that are from Odilia's Kyle Network, uh, Nijoki DiCaro and Nelly Omino. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today and a couple other people, Mr. Okeke. Um, and, and a few others. Thank you again for acknowledging MLK International Day of Service. We have to connect our global African narrative in service. You guys have a great day and make sure that you stay connected. Peace.